We've just a week to go now before we're live on stage with the new show, Cocaine Cowboys. Final tickets on sale for Limerick, Cork and Dublin from mcd.ie, our venues. Unassuming in every which way uh, seems to be John Donaghy, who we didn't know much about who's managed to almost reach his 60th year without coming on the radar of the Sunday world and yet um, is pleading guilty to 1.9 million worth of cocaine and has convictions for dogfighting. Yeah, it's an interesting character. Um, th- this guy turned up in Nace Circa Court just this week mm. and now he's he's has changed his name to John Donaghy. I think that's his mother's uh, maiden name. Um, but he was originally known as John Nibs, K-N-I-B-B-S. That's an unusual name. It, it is an unusual name. He's originally from Lincolnshire. And of course, it, it was such an unusual name when you Google it, you, the information comes up quite easily. So it was mentioned in court that he had 19 previous convictions, but 16 of them were dogfighting charges. Mm-hmm. So cruelty to animals. So it turns out, like he's considered like, you know, a major figure in organizing illicit, illegal uh, you know, these underground dogfighting and it's like pit bulls against this giant Spanish breed. You know, it was quite cruel, mm. some of the stuff. Um, was this all in England? This is all in the UK and it would have started in 2017, the investigation that the police and the RSPCA had involved about 30 dogs. Um, and he had previous convictions as well, going back to 2009 for, for cruelty to animals. And he was actually disqualified from owning an animal for life, from owning a dog. Um, and it turns out, as we heard this week, then he had no income except from breeding dogs. So here he was in rural northwest County Kildare, a dog breeder again, despite being disqualified from life and having been convicted in his absence in the UK. And therefore, theoretically, or not theoretically, but, you know, effectively a fugitive from UK justice and working away as, know, a, dog uh, here. as, as a dog breeder here. And what sort of dogs was he breeding? Um, it, it didn't mention in court. Uh, what he what what he was breeding this time, uh, but in all these other cases, it's been pit bulls and a particular Spanish breed. It, it's it's a very large dog. These are kind of cattle herding dogs, right. and he was trying to breed, according to some of the reports, the biggest possible fighting dogs you can get. So these aren't particularly, um, I imagine, nice dogs, you know. No. And and there were some horrific videos that were, were were found by the RSPCA, and these included, you know, one of these giant uh, Spanish dogs trying to jump out a window to get away from a fight. Um, two dogs fighting for 45 minutes. He, he had his own pit bull called Baddy. Uh, that, you know, there's pictures of having suffered you know, shocking injuries and that dog was never recovered, never rescued. Most of them were were um, rehomed, but they had to spend huge money on kenneling these dogs because they couldn't be put in with other dogs. Oh. And so it cost the charity. So was he thousands. sort of, he was breeding them and training them from birth basically to fight. Yeah. And yeah. how did they do that? Did they starve them or something? No, I mean, there's actually, again, I mean, they they they, they don't bring them out for walks. Like, they, they'll often have treadmills and they'll time to, you know, um, a kind of a, like a carousel. Like, I've seen these before in the past. Like, I had somebody show me around, like, a, a dogfighting training stud, for lack of a better word, in Limerick. And this is 20 years ago. Mm. And you could see kind of, you know, the kind of how they train them. And it's very much, they're, they're bred to fight other dogs. So they're kept deliberately uh, unsocialized with other dogs. So all their exercise is done, you know, in the gym, so to speak. Right. Um, so then when they're they're ready to fight, you know, they, they're, they'll just, they'll go for it. They're, you know, and that's where the, the old terminology and, or the old phrase on being up to scratch, that you bring a dog to the scratch, which is the line and the other dog, and then you let them go. So if he goes up to scratch, he's a fighting dog, he's willing to fight. And who goes to these? It's always been a really kind of tight-knit, small group of people. Um... You know, like, I mean, years and years ago, we we tried to, you know, kind of get in on them. Uh, but like, you know, it's like 14 people turn up. Everybody knows everybody. And you're, uh, out. And you're going to be getting in a, a van in the middle of nowhere yeah. with 10 other people, possibly of whom are involved in serious crime and traveling to an unknown location to watch this. So mm. I'm sure... Um, some other journalists might have had the courage to do, but I certainly didn't. I wasn't no, going to. I think I would have done that myself. I wouldn't like to see two animals being treated like that, or you know, or even the savagery of those yeah. fights. Like they're and tearing one another yeah. apart, aren't they? Uh, no, they are, and that's that's what it's about. It's until until one dog kind of basically backs down, and not necessarily to the death, but then the dogs that lose, like if they lose more than once, you know, or, I mean, they're they're effectively discarded. They're just right. thrown in the bin, or they're if possible used for breeding. But otherwise, they're not considered. They're, they're considered useless. Mm. 
And you, you would have had the likes of um, Troy Jordan, like, you know, uh, you know, a, a kind of well-known gangland figure that we've spoken about before. He, he, was, he was prosecuted one time over um, dogfighting. And now he, he was acquitted. But there was, there was very good evidence of a raid. He was certainly at a dogfight, but he was, he was acquitted of any kind of involvement in terms of organizing it and so on, which is what he'd been charged with. And do you think many of them happen here still? I'd say it's a really, it's a really tight um, uh, kind of underground Elite, scene. sort of, almost. Yeah, and you know, I suppose in a way like the sulky racing would be kind of the easy access part of the illicit sports. Yeah. Um, and dogfighting would be a whole new level. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of ordinary decent criminals who wouldn't have the stomach to look at two dogs rip each other apart as mm. well. You know, it's it's pretty nasty stuff, really, when you think about it. Um, and you know, you know, it's stuff. It you know, it's it's pretty medieval. It's it's even beyond that. It's like it goes all the way back. I imagine to Roman times yeah. and 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 kind of the Colosseum and having your 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 Christians fight a bull or a lion or whatever. Like so, in, in the meantime, I suppose that the lesser shows would have a couple of dogs having to go with each other or the roosters or you know the cockfighting. So I mean, it's 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 one of those. Um, it's one of those sports I imagine, like sulky racing, is a bit of a golf course as well, you know, where people can meet each other. Mm. I mean, certainly one contact I had years ago spoke about, you know, there was guys from Limerick involved in crime there and they were dogfighting with guys on the border and these fellas were involved with loyalist gangs. So, you know, it kind of, yeah. you know, you're going to meet a class of person that you're not going to meet anywhere else and they might be just the kind of per- kind of person you're willing to do business with. Mm-hmm. Like if you're willing to go as far as a dogfight, it shows that you're committed, you're spending a few quid. Uh, it shows that you're you're willing to, you know, trust these other people not to go to jail with. So it's kind of, it's a way of, of forming, a, you know, a solid bond that you're, you're effectively co- committing a crime with them. Mm. But it's also a pastime. It's a bit of gambling. So you can, you can have a bit of crack to some extent or you can chit chat or whatever it is. And it's a way of, it's a way of making contacts. And that's certainly used that way, I'd imagine. So John Nibbs from Lincolnshire came to Ireland and it was it here where he changed his name by deed poll to John Donaghy. He, he was. He actually did it in the UK, um, and that was part of the reason why he's been prosecuted again in 2016. He changed his name by deed poke because he wanted to basically set up a commercial dog breeding business. But of course, he was barred for life from mm-hmm. having a dog, so he couldn't do it. Um, and he was due to go on trial in 2019 in in Lincoln, but um, basically turned up in Ireland and was living in Tulsk and Roscommon for. Um, about three years or three and a half years and then he moved to this um, other location near Carberry in northwest Kildare where he has been for the last three or four years and that's where he'd been living with his wife um, or partner Kimberly Steele now I, th- there was we do have information about who the drugs belong to and like he he's, he wouldn't give that up he was very cooperative I mean so were he, the drugs found in this premises that he was operating this dog breeding yeah and they were they were actually found in the boot of his um, uh, 11 2011 uh, Ford Mondeo uh, and it was 20, 27 kilos in a in a in, in blocks in a, in a black refuse sack and it was all recorded him loading them in on his own CCTV so he oh. couldn't really have much chance <laughs> only to <laughs> admit that he knew yeah. it was there so I mean the guards found it pretty quick he was apparently very cooperative there was a young man on the premises at the time who had nothing to do with it and he 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 said like he took full responsibility there was a, I think a 110,000 in cash in a super value bag and a, a nice little detail that I thought that they threw in there sitting on the shelf in, in a hot press in the kitchen so he, he accepted that was his as well um, the guard said there was no signs of any trappings of wealth. Uh, he said he, he he said, look, he wasn't worried about himself, but he he'd be worried for his wife and children if he named who it was. But we have information that it's a, a serious criminal gang based in the Midlands who are actually the tar- target of the criminal assets bureau at the moment. So, so were they possibly then? He was being used to store the drugs. Obviously, um, is he? Willingly doing that, would you think, or is he been in some way come under pressure for cash, or is he doing it? Well, he he's he's come out with, um, I suppose it's a, a scenario that we've heard a lot of before. He's claiming he had a cocaine addiction. He was spending five to six hundred euro a week on cocaine, and this would explain the lack of, uh, you know, any any wealth around the house. But he didn't have any uh, any other income, and yet they were still bringing up, uh, you know, four kids all under the age of six. I might add. So I mean, it's a, a young family. 
his his wife is twenty five years. He's junior now. She say what age? Is yeah, it? now she was also convicted in uh, in the UK as you know aiding and abetting him in in the dog fighting and and for owning a fighting dog. So he he was more or less claiming that he was coerced, and the, and there was a line used by his defence lawyer saying you know the the debt just seemed to be getting bigger and bigger and never went away, and that that you know this was the the first time that you know he had done this. Um, the detective guard from the the organised crime and drugs unit did say, like, we do believe that the drugs arrived on that day. Now, I'm sure there are reasons for saying that, that there may, may well be other cases that are going to happen as a result of mm. this this one. So uh, there's probably more to come out in in, in regards to that. But um, but he, he 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 hadn't been convicted of anything here, so he's been six years in Ireland, but had you know has otherwise had a clean slate. You know, when you hear of a case where drugs are being found and it's, you know, as a result of an operation carried out by the Guard of Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau, they are largely intelligence-led investigations. They don't happen to be in that area. They're a specialist unit. They're not local police sort of seeing something unusual and stumbling upon drugs. This is obviously a targeted investigation um, centred on, as you say, a Midlands crew. Um there's nothing accidental about this find. No, I mean, that was said in court. They I mean, said they were acting on confident, confidential information. Mm. I mean, obviously, they don't go into it exactly no. how they know. Um, there, there was a few, of it, there was a couple of earlier bail hearings where there was a little bit more information that there was a surveillance operation set up. So they obviously clearly had an idea that something, you know, that there was going to be drugs at this location. Um, and and he was caught. I mean, it's it's quite an amount. I mean, initially the headlines were two million, but they they said in court this week it was one point nine, twenty seven point two kilos. So it's quite a lot. So what's what was he like in court? I mean, a guy we've never laid eyes on, and uh, with this background and this dog fighting, you kind of expect a really tough, uh, big kind of a character. Um, you know, breeding these animals and organizing these horrific fights. He, he was um, an unremarkable looking chap. I mean, you know, he just looked like a ordinary fella in his, in his blue jumper. He, mm. he was kind of, uh, you know, making sure he was, he was kind of alert to making sure he was going where the prison officers wanted him to go. And I mean, he, he you know, I mean, he was described in court as being cooperative from, from day one. I mean, he took responsibility when the guards raided. I mean, they, he basically signed documents to more or less say that he was going to plead guilty from the very start, which, you know, gets you, you get to have more mm. time off. It's better than a not guilty, even better than a not guilty plea later on in the day. So like he, he was always, he was always, um, you know, admitting that, you know, th these were his drugs and it was his cash. So, but he, look, he was a small guy. He didn't, re didn't really get to speak. I think he said yes at one stage when there was a question mm. asked. And was um, the wife there? No, it didn't. It, it didn't appear to be anybody mm. there belonging to him. So he's going to be sentenced later this month. Yeah. So we'll, we'll find out then. So that basically, the judge wanted to wanted to hear more about um, uh, there, there was there was a talk about that he'd kicked his 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 drug addiction, and she wanted more material from the governor, basically a governor's report, really to back up what was being said in court that he's on an enhanced regime, he's working as a cleaner, and he's put all this behind him, and he wants to move on with his life. So, the more interesting uh, evidence that may be given at the sentence hearing would be from the Gardaí or the state and, and a wider sort of an, an insight into what this case, what was going on here, who the targets of this case are, what he's believed to have been, how he's believed to have been acting for them. No, th th this was the sentence hearing. So, so it's, so it's oh, really much just for the judge yeah. to come back with, with, their, with, 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 with her own kind of... Um, Sentence, here, yeah. sentence deliverance. I suppose, mm -hmm. for lack of a better phrase. So, um, so presumably on the next date or whenever, um, Judge Martina Baxter will decide. You know, she'll explain. You know, they they go into a big long kind of uh, explanation of why. You know, they're they're finding in this case it's the the headline sentence is twelve years or yes. eight years, and then they talk about the mitigation and they take this into account. And judges take this very seriously now because it kind of stops appeals saying that this wasn't taken into account. And even things like, uh, you know, there's a couple of uh, references were handed in and letters from people which weren't, you know, the, what, the details of which we didn't really hear. But I, I think um, Judge Baxter is one of these judges that likes to get the detail and know that the people who wrote these know why they wrote these letters mm, about, mm. about John Donahue and wants to know if they're going to be, if they're going to come to court and back up what they said in the letter by giving evidence. So... And as you say, there's likely other cases possibly still before the courts that'll be linked to this and the story will probably emerge as time goes on. 
Very interesting. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you again, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.